Welcome everyone to The Watchlist, Australia's newest investor-focused webinar series for ASX-listed companies to pitch to real investors and be added to their watchlists. You've no doubt created and curated your own watchlist of companies you've invested in and companies you're watching for future investment consideration. For companies, getting on your watch list is a big deal. It means they're being watched and have the chance for you to invest in them and follow their journey. Today, we bring together a range of companies that I know are on your watch list or should be considered to be added. Presenting today are Vulcan Energy Resources, ASX code VUL, Vulcan Mining and Minerals, ASX code BMM, CGN Resources, which is eyeing an ASX listing with the proposed ASX ticker code of CGR, and Lithium Universe, ASX code LU7. Each company will present, then management will be on hand to answer any questions you have. So make sure you have your questions ready of management and submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, let's get started. Our first presenter is Alex Handley from the newly listed Lithium Universe ASX code LU7. Chaired by Australian lithium trailblazer Iggy Tan, Lithium Universe Limited's main objective is to establish itself as a prominent lithium project builder by prioritising swift and successful development of lithium projects in Quebec, Canada. Alex, over to you. Thanks, David. Uh, after a 10-year hiatus, uh, a new lithium company emerges from the galaxy. Introducing Lithium Universe Limited, building a lithium future. If it sounds like Galaxy 2.0, the, the, the lithium trailblazer Iggy Tan is back. Uh, Iggy started his time back in 1995, having commissioned the lithium carbonate plant with, with green bushes, before moving on to spearhead Galaxy Resources as managing director from a $10 million market cap to about $2.5 billion at merger with Oracobra. Iggy was a, 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 a trailblazer, a pioneer, and, and recognised the, the future of the lithium-ion battery future from an early stage. Iggy uh, was responsible through his time at Galaxy uh, for, for building the first fully integrated mine to refinery project. This project uh, comprised of, of the Mount Catlin uh, spodumene project, the Jiangsu lithium carbonate plant, and project generation activities also in Quebec, James Bay, uh, as well as the Cell de Vida brine project in Argentina. Notably, the, the Mount Catlin project, now owned and, and operated by Allchem, uh, uh, is, a, is a, a, a 1 million tonne per annum mining operation, uh, leading to about 140,000 tonne of, of, of spodumene concentrator. Uh, this, uh, notably, when it was commissioned, uh, the, 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 the spodumene concentrate price was really only $260 a tonne now trading upwards of, of $3,300 a tonne. On the right-hand side, uh, the, the lithium carbonate plant at Jiangsu, uh, now owned by Tianxi. Uh, this, uh, at, during its day, was the biggest uh, lithium carbonate plant uh, in China and remains to this day uh, a benchmark for process technology within the country. This is uh, rated at 17,000 tonne per annum, and, and when it was commissioned, the, the this, the lithium carbonate price was was six thousand dollars a ton. Now trading upwards of thirty thousand dollars a ton, and and this provides you know a, a bit of perspective uh, in terms of insight into the the the, the real lithium uh, trailblazer in which Iggy Tan was uh, within the early stages of of the industry as as we know it today. Joining Iggy is is Pat Scallum. Pat uh, ran green bushes uh, for 25 years, uh, uh, saw, oversaw many major expansions uh, within the, the operations and brings a very focused uh, lithium skill set to the group. Why Canada? Uh, it's uh, in comparison to Australia, it, uh, it's, uh, Australia's produced about 300,000 tonne of, of, of lithium carbon equivalent in 2022 and really has cemented itself as a, as a, as a backbone of the, the the Chinese uh, lithium ion battery chain. Uh, in comparison, although the ground is very fertile in Canada, little to no production has really come out of, of the country within the last two decades, uh, with only cyanide mining coming online this year. Uh, what we're seeing is, is Australian expertise, uh, having embedded uh, lithium experience, now making their way to, to Canada 
to explore and develop the, this next frontier in, in, in lithium. And as uh, Mr. Lith Mr. Lithium himself, Joe Lowry says, uh, Canada wants to be the Australia to North America. A few words from our chairman, Iggy Tan, lithium, uh, lithium projects are taking too long to come online and there's not enough to meet future demand. Investment in Canada has been substantial, yet no lithium uh, has really come out of the country. And finally, there are many lithium explorers, but not many have the, the expertise to actually execute projects. Introducing the Apollo Lithium Project, which is situated within the James Bay region, uh, about 66 kilometres south of the Trans Tiger. When this was staked about by our partner, uh, it, uh, it was staked between two then unknown uh, companies that were really finding its feet within the region. And, uh, you know, commanding a, a very large uh, tenure of a 240 square kilometres. We're not here for exploration's sake. Uh, we're here to build a project as quick as we can. The, uh, the project in James Bay, uh, situated uh, next to proximal to hydro, hydro power and, and, and airport uh, at LG4, was uh, situated both within 30 kilometres of Patriot's Corvette project and Winsome Resources' Adena project. The, the, the license itself uh, is in the same greenstone belt as, as both of these projects, including Cancer from Winsome Resources, and notably has the same sort of structural conditioning, uh, as well as the same sort of host geology as what we're seeing within our peers and neighbours within the, within the area. Now, notably, as you can see here, uh, you know, we use a yardstick in the top right hand corner. Now, what we're seeing at Patriot, obviously, they've just released 109 million tonne resource. But in terms of, of intercepts uh, that they have found throughout their discovery phase, you know, we're looking at 156 metres at 2%. Uh, and, and down at Winsome, you know, from surface, you know, 107 metres at 1.34%. At so uh, in, in using uh, the, the, the benchmark in the top right-hand corner, uh, these are neither good or excellent uh, discoveries. Uh, these are quite outstanding. Uh, these intercepts are high-grade, thick mineralisation, and notably close to surface. The other main attribute or, or what's becoming typical within the region is that they, they form these whaleback features or, or outcrops within the, the, uh, the underlying country rock. As you can see here, this is CV5 and uh, notably something else uh, within all chem at James Bay. The other component uh, on the left-hand side there is the coarse spodumene component, uh, which is becoming prevalent and typical within the region. Now, why do they occur as outcrops? Uh, what you can see here is, is all chems James Bay deposit as an example. Uh, this is a, a, a near, near, near vertical, steeply dipping stacked lenses, uh, which, which makes itself amenable to, to an open pit mining method. So, so cutting down and, uh, on, on, on OPEX and, and on initial CAPEX, producing you know, a lucrative viability for the project. In terms of Apollo, uh, what we know, uh, there's 17 known pegmatite outcrops uh, on the license from the government data set. Uh, we'll be looking to, to get boots on ground and, and ground truth these, these pegmatite outcrops as soon as possible. From a coarse spodumene perspective, as I said, uh, the Canset, the, the James Bay All, All Chem, the Corvette and the Adena project all hold uh, coarse spodumene. Now, the reason why this is, is, is so important uh, and the benefits of coarse spodumene are, are, sim are simply down to the, the, four, you know, the simple processing uh, downstream. So it's a four-stage crushing circuit before leading to a DMS circuit where it's separated from, from waste and, and spodumene. Now, notably, Iggy built Mount Catlin uh, from a, a coarse spodumene project, uh, and James Bay All Chem is also coming out with a coarse spodumene design. Uh, what we believe is, is also going to happen at, at Patriot up on the James Bay uh, in tra Trans Tiger region. Uh, this, this is obviously uh, the benefits are uh, re reduced ca initial capex and, and reduced ongoing opex. Now the uh, the James Bay region is is a hive of activity, as everyone knows, uh, with with you know uh, the recent you know, significant resources being Patriots, uh, 109 million ton resource, uh, some sort of six weeks ago now, and and Orchem's uh, resource upgrade of 110 million ton resource. So these um these you know 100 plus million ton resources uh, now sort of put themselves in the eighth and ninth uh, position of, of globally significant uh, resources. Uh, which puts us in uh, a, a great neighbourhood. 
Also from an investment perspective, uh, Abermal had come Patriot uh, after that, that resource, uh, that maiden resource announcement. But, but more importantly, we're seeing Rio Tinto now making waves with, with uh, various joint, you know, joint venture ag agreements in and around uh, the Apollo Lithium project. So with Mid Midlands uh, and Azimut Exploration. Uh, this is the, 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 the US Dream Team. Uh, these uh, st obviously made a name for themselves because they're still uh, uh, we're still talking about them today. But uh, uh, we've assembled the, what we call the Lithium Dream Team, uh, comprising obviously Iggy Tan and, and Pat Scallon, uh, but notably uh, a, a Dr. Jingwan Lu, who, who's a uh, international expert for downstream processing. Uh, Roger Roger Pover uh, from a plant operation perspective, Terry Stark, who actually was a, the former GM of operations for Galaxy Resources. Uh, we've also got Huyen Yen, who, who designed and, and actually constructed the Mount Catlin project for Iggy, and, and also John Loxton, uh, former Hatch, uh, who actually project managed the Jiangsu lithium carbonate plant built in, in China. Uh, with them, Alex Hanley, uh, myself, uh, Gernot Abel, Exec Director, and uh, Justin Rivers, uh, uh, Head of Geology. Uh, we've commenced very preliminary uh, work desktop study-wise, uh, and we've we've enlisted the, the help of Core AI, uh, and we're using uh, machine learning from, from regional projects uh, like Corvette uh, and Adena to really hone in on, on those specific features uh, that they're seeing within you know their outcropping the outcropping nature of of those main discoveries. So uh, we're 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 we've prioritised about twenty eight targets at the moment. So we'll, we'll be getting boots on ground to really understand what they look like, uh, and then uh, going through a sort of a, a prioritisation uh, schedule before uh, hoping to drill as soon as we can uh, in the coming months. Uh, the the company comprises a suite of projects uh, across Australia and Canada. Uh, the, the Voyager Rare Earth project in Tasmania, uh, which is right next door to AVX Resources, which has a 27 million tonne uh, uh, rare earth project, as well as the Lafroy Lithium project in, in WA, proximal to Bald Hill and Mount Marion. Uh, the, the other project we have in the suite is, is in Ontario. Uh, it's the, the Margo Lake project, and uh, it's situated uh, just right next door to, to the pack and, and spark deposit run by TSX listed Frontier Lithium. But all focus for us is, is the Apollo Lithium Project, which is obviously within a very prospective region, uh, nestled in between two major lithium discoveries uh, of the last 12 months. Uh, and we've, we've obviously comprised and, and built a, a, a dream team uh, that uh, runs unparalleled within this, this junior space. So, so please uh, join us on our mission to the, to the universe. Thanks, Alex. Great presentation, obviously a cracking listing. Um, question. Do you start with the team or the project? What came first? Uh, the the project came first, uh, and uh, the the team uh, was built around it. Uh, we, we attracted Iggy back to the industry based on on the the prospectivity of the Apollo license in particular, uh, and uh, from there we 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 built out the uh, the team to to really sort of understand uh, or really I suppose obtain the necessary skill sets to actually build a project. And I think that's one of the, the, the main points of difference, uh, David, is, is that um, you know, we're looking at, at the opportunity to, to really utilise and leverage not only Iggy's uh, prolific skill set, but also the skill set of, of the, the Dream Team themselves. And in terms of the projects, uh, particularly um, your key project there in Quebec, how, how did you get it? How hard was it to acquire um, and the work that had to go into acquiring it and then developing the plan from there? Because as you say, you are in a very hot neighbourhood. Yeah, that's right. So our, our, our uh, partner who still retains a 20% uh, a uh, interest in the project and is a large shareholder of Lithium Universe, he pegged this ground uh, really within the early stages of the, the James Bay um, you know, boom. He was, he was looking for a prospective ground uh, within, uh, within James Bay, uh, proximal to, to recent discoveries, uh, he enlisted the, the help of uh, a pegmatite expert, Dr. Julie Selway out of Ontario, uh, to really sort of hone in and, and find this, this land package. Uh, he was, I suppose, uh, one of the first movers, having sort of started that process back in January 2022, when, when things really, you know, before things really started heating up there. 
Uh, since then, obviously, David, we've we've gone through a recompliance, uh, uh, and uh, the previous company, which was Mogul Games Group, uh, is now uh, acquired the pro uh, projects themselves, and and we've we've now sort of transformed ourselves into a uh, uh, mineral exploration and, and junior mining company. And in terms of exploration activities, do you have a timeline on drilling or other exploration activities that those watching should be focused on? Yeah, we're we're, uh, we're getting boots on ground and and uh, we're going through a methodical process of of really firstly understanding where to hit first. Uh, as you can understand, uh, the, uh, David, the the magnitude of the license being two hundred and forty square kilometres, uh, it's it's quite large. Uh, so we're uh, we're deploying uh, boots on ground at the moment, uh, and we'll be really uh, assessing the prospectivity first. Uh, from a, uh, a drill definition and, and targeting uh, perspective. In terms of, of, of drilling, uh, we're hoping to be drilling uh, by the end of the year. Now, you did touch from a permitting point of view um, in regards to the critical mineral strategy. You did mention it and, and how it could provide exploration funding. What's the government doing as part of this? Yeah, it's 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 quite interesting, uh, David. The... Uh, the critical mineral strategy, which was released in December 2022, it, uh, it not only sort of uh, alluded to the fact of, of exploration investment, but also a streamlining of, of the regulatory processes and permitting processes, which is, I suppose, more important for, for, for us in terms of getting a, um, a project across the, you know, across the line quicker. Now, what, what they seem to be doing and, and what I've heard from the ground is that they're actually embedding uh, let's say, uh, delegates uh, within the government bolstering the team to actually help streamline the permitting process, both from a, from a mining pro processing environmental uh, perspective. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually quite a uh, proactive approach, not only from a, a funding or investment perspective, but also building out the systems uh, internally within the Quebec and, and the provincial governments. And in terms of First Nations, what's your contact been like with those groups? I understand Cree Nation is probably your First Nation um, body there. What's what's the contact been like? Yeah, that's right. The Cree. Yep, we uh, we've we've had uh, very preliminary uh, discussions uh, with the Cree. Uh, the the Apollo license itself is 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 on uh, Mistissini ground, which is actually. Uh, south of of the license, which is near Shivagamu and and uh, Saguenay, uh, these uh, these Cree Nation, we've communicated with them on on our our intentions with the license, uh, and uh, we've been liaising with the Cree Minerals Board also, who who really support us and and really helped us um, first engage and and start that communication process. So uh, early engagement is the best, as you can understand, David, and and uh, yeah, we're we're doing all the right things, and, and I hope um, uh, we we get to um, go there and, and shake hands with them very soon. Um, final question, a good question. Is the business model based around acquisitions and JVs in order to drive momentum before you start drilling? Uh, at, at this stage, David, we're a, um, you know, uh, aligned with our prospectus, we're a you know, mineral exploration company. Uh, we are, I suppose, we've, we've got a huge network. Uh, we've got a dream team which has uh, experience uh, within, within Quebec. Uh, but also extended network that that could potentially provide project generation, uh, not only project generation opportunities, uh, but also uh, opportunities of uh, early production, uh, whether that be user, utilizing the the lithium universe stream team uh, in a, in some sort of extended capacity. So uh, we're assessing everything. We're dynamic. We're ad agile. Uh, we're a new company, and and uh, we're hungry to really help the the Canadian Quebec province to 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 really make a mark on the lithium industry globally well having worked with Iggy in the past you've definitely got someone who uh who works hard and and looks uh, well outside the box to look for results for shareholders so as you say a dream team lithium universe company to watch newly listed exciting times ahead alex thanks for the presentation thanks david cheers I would now like to introduce Stan Woolley from CGN Resources, which, as I said in the intro, is proposing to list on the ASX with a ticker code CGR. CGN Resources is a dedicated exploration company targeting discovery of copper, nickel and specialty metals in the West Arunta Erosion. Its mission is to deliver value to shareholders through 
disciplined and sustainable exploration leading to a major discovery. Now, Stan, over to you. I'll just get you to turn on your... How's that? Uh, we, we've definitely got sound. And if you just accept the, yep, there we go. Got you. No problems at all. Right. Thanks, Stan. Over to you. No problems. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, and thanks to Market One for the opportunity to talk about um, our exciting new listing uh, of CGN resources. Uh, we, we we think we're in a fantastic location to, uh, to make a, a copper, nickel or critical metal discovery. Uh, and uh, we lodged our prospectus last week, so we're anticipating opening that uh, prospectus uh, any day now. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, that's just our disclaimers. Uh, yeah, look, I guess in terms of investment highlights, uh, we've got a fantastic 950 square kilometre package right in the heart of the west, uh, west of Runter origin. Uh, and... As you can see from that picture, we've got some great neighbours. Other people also think it's a great idea to, to do exploration. We've got Rio Tinto to our west, who's committed $50 million. Uh, WA1, if you've been following their story, have made a major discovery of niobium uh, in a carbonatite and encounter have as well, and they've been highly rewarded for it. We've been out there exploring as a private exploration company for 10 years. So we've already spent $6 million on the ground, which gives us a great database of drilling, uh, geophysical surveys, airborne and ground-based, and that's allowed us to uh, produce six, what we call our high-priority targets, four for IOCG, one for nickel and one for air earths. Uh, and we're looking to kick off our drilling to align with our, um, with our listing in late September, early October. Uh, the IPO itself, we've got a minimum raise of $8 million with a maximum of 10 We've had strong interest, uh, which is fantastic, and we think we'll be closer to the 10 than the 8 which is great news. It gives us a really good war chest to go and do high-quality exploration for the next couple of years. Um, as I said, we're looking to list probably early October, and we'll kick off drilling uh, two of our IOCG targets, Tantor and Soros, when we list. Next slide, please. This is just a quick snapshot of where we're at today. So we're a private company. We've been doing exploration for 10 years. We've got 60 million shares currently in the book. We're looking to raise eight at a minimum at 20 cents, which will take us to 100 million uh, shares uh, and a market cap of 20, which we think is a really nice, tight, small structure. Uh, our shareholders are um, have been a curated list of mostly high net worths and then also management uh, that uh, are all investors in the resource business uh, and are keen to stay with us through this journey. Our board is uh, highly experienced. Daryl, our chairman, has been a company director of multiple ASX listed companies and is a very experienced metallurgist. I'm a geologist by background um, and uh, have been heavily involved in consulting and strategic advice to boards over the last uh, 30 years, really. Uh, Grant Mooney, a multiple uh, director of ASX listed companies and a highly experienced company secretary. So we've got a good mix of technical uh, corporate and governance there. And our advisors uh, on the sort of technical geology side, Dr. Mark Allen, uh, an expert in IOCG and, and copper in general, and Tom Redcliffe, who was the guy that kicked off this project uh, looking for diamonds originally, but a highly experienced geologist and brings all of those stakeholder relationships through the uh, through the through our process. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a bit of a, I guess, a demonstration of sort of what it was like five years ago when we were out there. We were an early mover. It was good geoscience that took us there. Uh, we recognised the potential for this region to host well, a really diverse set of, of possible opportunities, and it allowed us to peg this really substantial ground holding. Five years ago, very little interest. You move forward to today with a little bit of discovery and uh, some money to go and look, uh, and all of a sudden that entire West Arunta, uh region there is blocked out with high quality explorers. Um, and we think we're in like, yeah, well, the most prospective part of the West Toronto. We sit right against the Central Australian suture and there's a major coastal features that run right through our tenement as well as a number of intrusives. Next slide, please. 
Uh, it's not just us that think it's a, a really amazing place to be doing exploration. Uh, Geoscience Australia, uh, GSWA have done quite a lot of research here from sort of 2015 through to 2018 and highlighted this area, the West Arunta, as highly prospective for IOCG and nickel, uh, magmatic nickel type projects. In fact, the whole Arunta has been sort of flagged as that. And that's why people like IGO and Rio Tinto have taken major land holdings. Um, We've got, uh, as I said, like our, our neighbours are strong. We've got good ground. We think it's ripe for discovery. And there's a lot of money that has been going to be poured into here. Uh, Rio's committed 50 million. WA1's raised 30 and is spending it uh, as we speak. ENR have raised quite a bit and are also doing great work. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of the six targets that we'll be looking to explore over the next uh, two years. Uh, Tantor, Soros, Snorky and Horton are IOCG targets. Uh, Shep is a nickel target and Hathi is a rare earths target. Uh, if we could just go to the next slide, I'll run through a bit more detail on each of those. Uh, so Tantor is what I would call a classical IOCG target. It's a, a mag high with a gravity high nestled up in against it. It is really similar in its setup to one of the other great IOCGs in Australia, Prominent Hill. The scale is similar. The, the way that the mag and the, and, the, and the gravity sit together is very similar. There's a, that sort of dark blue you can see in, that, in the left-hand picture it is a major crustal scale fault. So it sits up against that. Uh, and that is really all of the pieces of architecture you want to see for a uh, IOCG target. And so we'll be looking to drill this as our first target. We've got some EIS funding to support that. Uh, and we will plunge a 600 metre deep diamond hole right into the heart of that gravity anomaly uh, as our first project, which is you know a little ballsy, but uh, we're very excited to be doing it. Next slide, please. Soros, uh, in many ways, is similar to uh, Tantor. It's a regional, regionally significant uh, gravity anomaly. Uh, it sits right up against, again, another major crustal feature, possibly the biggest one that runs through our property, a splay off the central Australian suture. So it's very close to a triple point junction. Again, we uh, sought and received EIS funding to go and drill this. Uh, you can see the modelling above has it as a very deep rooted system. Uh, we've got a 700 metre hole on that image. We're actually only going to drill 600 metres, well, unless we find something, and then we'll just keep going. But um, so this will be the other target that we drill uh, in October, just post listing. Next slide, please. Uh, SHEP is a really interesting target. Uh, it's based on a geochem intercept from a hole that was put in the wrong spot targeting a kimberlite. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, however you want to look at it, uh, it actually hit a 30 metre zone of highly anomalous nickel above half a percent uh, and a couple of metres in there are above 1%. Uh, as well as the nickel, it's highly anomalous in chromium, cobalt, vanadium, copper. Uh, it's got a sulphur kick. Uh, and so we, th and it also overlies this really interesting uh, sill like magnetic feature. So this is a high priority target, but we won't get to this one until we kick off our big programs next year. Um, and we're really excited to go and test both those. The, the green dots you can see there are ones we have permitted, and then we're seeking permitting to go and drill the other ones. Next slide, please. Uh, our Hathi target is a rare earth target, again, a geochemical and geophysical target. Uh, it was a kimberlite uh, targeted hole, and you can see three holes there, 44, 45, and 46. Uh, 45, the, the hole of interest, hit a 37 metre zone at 0.38 total rare earths, which is highly anomalous uh, and really unusual for a kimberlite. The two kimberlites either side of it had some, but this is literally 10 times higher uh, in its anomalies and the, the, the surrounding kimberlites. Uh, it also sits up against this interesting dike-like feature, uh, which looks like it comes off a much larger intrusive feature, which is that purple uh, feature you can see there. So we're going to come in, uh, read, test along the strike of that dike-like feature, and then also hit those X and Y targets, which are large. Uh, it, it's the highest magnetic component, and it also comes closer to surface there. So this uh, will also be part of our next year's programs. Next target, uh, next slide, please. 
Snorky and Horton are regionally significant gravity uh, anomalies nestled between two large regional scale faults which share that same northwest, uh, southwest, northeast trend, which is consistent throughout our project. Uh, they also have some anomalous drill holes nearby. Uh, the nearest one is that red dot you can see just north of uh, Grav uh, G, uh, which is our snorky target. And it uh, has sort of plus a thousand ppm uh, copper and cobalt. And there's a couple of holes a little bit further away that get up to a quarter of a percent copper uh, and uh, several thousand percent cobalt. So we see mineralization in the drill holes in this region. So these are sort of high priority targets for our next year as well. Uh, they'll get sort of first pass drilling. Uh, next target, uh, next slide, please. Uh, look, we've been, uh, although we've been a company exploring for 10 years, our IPI process has been very compressed. Uh, we see an opportunity to sort of leverage off the success of our neighbours to some extent, but we think our targets are possibly better than what they listed with. Um, and uh, we've managed to keep to a really tight budget, a really tight timeline, uh, which has allowed us to put our prospectus in last week as we had planned. That should open this week. Uh, we get drilling at the end of the month uh, and we list in early October. Uh, the future looking programs are all, all designed, uh, are mostly permitted, and so we're ready to go for next year's uh, series of programs. Next slide, please. Sort of, I guess, as a, as a snapshot of uh, investment summary, we've got an amazing 950 square metre, uh, a square kilometre package right in the heart of one of the hottest uh, districts for exploration right now. We've got amazing targets uh, that are based on good geoscience and high quality data sets. Uh, the previous work that we've done there gives us this great database but also allows us when we get new data to bring into our database and really refine those targets quickly or, or establish new ones. Uh, there is probably another 10 targets that sit below our high priority targets uh, that we're really interested to get more data on. We've got a high quality team. It's quite lean at the moment, but everyone in it uh, is, is high quality and highly experienced in the job they need to do. We've got great relationships with the local traditional owners, the Jammer Jammer people. We were the first company to sign an agreement with them back in 2013. So we've been working with them for 10 years and have great relationships uh, there, which allows us to be very dynamic when, we, when it comes to permitting things. Um, our upcoming drilling program is super exciting. Uh, that's two deep, really interesting targets that uh, we're really hopeful will generate a great deal of interest uh, not long after we list. Uh, at the valuation of $20 million market cap at a 20 cent listing price, when you compare it to our neighbours in this district, seems like exceptional value to me. So uh, get on board if you can, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Stan. A great story, great neighbourhood, um, exciting times ahead. Firstly, the obvious one, how did you manage to get such a strong land package in this tightly held and highly prospective region? Uh, look, I think it's common in, in this business, uh, some good geology and some good luck. Uh, we, The guys that started the company, uh, Tom Redcliffe was one of them I mentioned, and Zlad Sass, went out there with a the clear idea that this was right for large magmatic systems. They went there targeting diamonds, uh, and although they uh, they were successful, really, they, they discovered Australia's largest kimberlite field, uh, micro diamonds in loam, but uh, they found 280 kimberlites, tested 50 of them. Unfortunately, none of them contained diamonds. But what it did do is it enabled us to get a better understanding of geology. Uh, and we were able then to sort of pivot into these larger magmatic systems. And so their good work of getting on the ground early uh, was probably the, the main reason we've ended up with such a, a great package. But also keeping it in good standing, as you know, like making sure these things stay live and active. We've managed to roll over the tenure and really create uh, all our tenure still has long life. So we're really lucky in that respect. And we're sort of lucky that uh, there's been some good discoveries around us. But I would say it was good geoscience that took us there. And what are your hopes for this upcoming drilling program? Uh, look, whenever you go into a new uh, exploration greenfield program uh, when you've done a lot of work well me personally I, I get very excited 
uh, it's a very exciting time to go and, uh, you know, it's like having your first child. You get to uh, go out and gaze upon it and see what's what's there. These are big targets. You know, I'd like to see that we have, you know, a 400 metre intercept above a percent copper, but your first drill hole into a major magmatic target is not likely to deliver that. What I would like to see is a, a proof of concept uh, the evidence of a large magmatic system that might be, you know, large hematitic alteration, magnetite alteration, some uh, evidence of base metals, that to me would be uh, a, an exceptional start to then be able to go back next year with a big program and really test these things in detail. And it is a big package of ground. You've touched on a number of targets that you will be focusing on. Are there additional targets that are sort of the next tier or, or, or the next ones on in the pipe? Uh, yeah, certainly. So we've really concentrated. We went there with the idea of looking for large magmatic systems. Uh, so we've done our targeting around that. And the six targets we've got are high quality and, and well-researched and I think really relevant targets. Outside of that, there's probably another 10 what I would call intrusive targets that just require more work. We need to get some gravity over them. Uh, we would look, like to refine them a little bit before we, uh, you know, commit to drilling. So we've got a number of next stage um, geophysical uh, programs that we'll be doing next year to give us a better data set, uh, especially along the Southern Corridor, right up against the Central Australian Suture. Uh, that, that area in particular has some really amazing looking uh, geophysical features, which are definitely intrusive related. So we just need to do a little bit more work on those before we commit to them. Well, as you say, a big land package, exciting neighbourhood, a lot to be done and uh, much to follow with the company moving forward. Um, really look forward to following the, the listing or the proposed listing and how that rolls out for anyone looking to take up an investment opportunity there. Obviously, CGN Resources website would be the place to go over the coming week uh, to yeah. subscribe initially. And then also when the prospectus goes live, that'll be the place yeah, to find. The, just sorry to interrupt. The prospectus is already on the website. So if okay. you have any interest, go and uh, download the prospectus. Uh, and like I said, we're, we're hoping to open anytime soon. So thanks very much for the opportunity, David. Perfect. Thanks, Stan. We follow with interest. Cheers. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Francis Wedden from Vulcan Energy, ASX code VUL. Founded in 2018, Vulcan's unique zero-carbon lithium project aims to decarbonise lithium production through developing the world's first net carbon neutral lithium business with the co-production of renewable geothermal energy on a mass scale. Francis, look forward to hearing more about it. Over to you. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, Avmion, and thanks to everyone for your time today. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully, you can see that. Right. Um, well, uh, there's a disclaimer at the beginning of this presentation, which I'll take as read. This is on our website. Um, thanks, everyone, for your time today. Uh, in a nutshell, Vulcan is is two things rolled into one. So we are a producing renewable energy company. Uh, so we have a commercial geothermal renewable energy plant, which is on your screens um, in southwest Germany, in the upper Rhine Valley, bordering France. But we're also building a lithium business, and this will take over as the main business in the years to come, and we'll far outstrip the renewables business in terms of revenue. In doing so, in building an integrated uh, lithium and renewable energy project, uh, what we're doing is we're building the world's first zero carbon lithium business. So producing lithium with a net zero carbon footprint, and then a co-product or a byproduct of geothermal renewable energy as well. Um, in doing so, we plan to produce renewable heat for more than a million people by 2030. We're mostly producing renewable power at the moment. We're increasingly um, ramping up the, the renewable heating sides of the business. And we're aiming to produce enough lithium hydroxide, but around about a million electric vehicles per annum, obviously, depending on battery chemistry. That represents the first two phases of our production, which um, would be around 50,000 tonnes per annum lithium hydroxide. In doing so, and this is the key differentiator, we aim to avoid about a million tonnes of CO2 emissions per annum. So a really significant decarbonising effect once the project is up and running. 
The project looks a bit like this. It is not a mine, that's the first thing to say. So it looks actually a lot like an integrated oil and gas project, just minus the oil and gas. So we've got your well sites in the upstream, which are producing hot lithium rich brine from between two and four kilometers depth in the upper Rhine Graben. So we're producing brine already. We have producing uh, wells already into this system. And that then gets pumped to a renewable energy plant where you produce heat and power. And this is baseload renewable energy. So it really is the, the holy grail of renewable energy at the moment. Um, you then sell that power and heat into the grid. Um, on the power side, we get a nice feed-in tariff. Um, on the heat side, you typically have an offtake agreement with the local consumer. And then what normally happens is the brine gets re-injected back into the reservoir and then gets heated up again. Um, but what we do this time is we, we uh, pass it through what we call our lithium extraction plant or LEP. And there we pass the brine through a series of columns and we use a technique which has been used in the industry commercially since 1996 called adsorption type direct lithium extraction. So the brine touches uh, a series of columns where um, uh, the brine comes into contact with some aluminate-based um, adsorbent resin. And the resin basically takes the lithium chloride out of the brine and leaves everything else in. The brine then gets re-injected minus the um, lithium. The lithium then gets washed off using a water strip. So it's a very low reagent process. The loading is driven by the heat and the salinity and the unloading is driven by water. So once again, the, the lithium is following the salinity gradient. Um, commercial producers who use this technique use gas to heat up the brine. We um, don't use gas. Our key differentiator is our waste brine off the geothermal plant is still warm. It's about 60 degrees after the energy generation process. And that's the perfect temperature to run the lithium extraction. So that's our unique differentiator. Our heat comes from a renewable source, not a fossil fuel source. And then we produce a lithium chloride concentrate, about a 40% lithium chloride concentrate, which gets transported to the last step of the process where we have our, what we call our central lithium plant, which produces lithium hydroxide. And that uses electrolysis um, using commercially available chloralkali cells. Um, it's a process that's been used for over 100 years in the chloralkali industry, and the only difference is we're um, employing uh, lithium chloride instead of sodium chloride to drive the process. But it's a very well understood, very well known process. Throughout this whole process, we produce more renewable energy than we consume. So it's a net uh, negative actually process because we're decarbonizing the grid with the excess energy that we sell. It's a net carbon negative process. But for simplicity's sake, we call it the zero carbon lithium project. And that's the unique differentiator for us. Um, it's been a bit of a journey to get to this point. So we were founded in 2018 as a, as a startup. Um, my background is I was previously in hard rock lithium and I was involved in uh, developing some assets in the Pilbara, which um, became part of the Pilbara Minerals project and is now in, in production, um, supplying the, the Asian market. So Vulcan was really my, my lithium 2.0. Um, and I started it with a, um, with a chap called Dr. Horst Freuter, who's a geothermal expert, um, because we're focused on developing these geothermal brines. And really, we started with the goal of zero carbon lithium, working backwards from there, how do we develop this? Over the journey, we've built um, a lot of in-house lithium extraction expertise, particularly this type of lithium extraction. And we've acquired four German companies along the journey as well, two engineering companies, one drilling contract labor company and uh, one um, producing renewable energy company as well. We've raised about 500 million Australian over the journey as well, including um, investments by Hancock Prospecting and also uh, from Stellantis, which is uh, the world's fifth largest automaker includes brands such as Peugeot, Citroen, Opel, Fiat, Chrysler, um, Jeep, et cetera. Uh, so Stellantis is our second largest shareholder. And we have five binding lithium hydroxide agreements signed with um, Stellantis, but also with Volkswagen, Renault, Yumicor, and LG. Um, so we've sold out the first five years of production. We've gone through scoping study, EFS, and DFS. Now we're in our bridging uh, study phase. So we're aiming to get to a class two estimate 
Um, and we're basically going into that execution phase of the project. Um, we've got about 240 million uh, Aussie cash, um, which we're deploying towards execution. We need to raise a lot more, to be clear, to, um, uh, to build this project, but we are deploying our cash towards preparatory CapEx work. So we're already getting into that execution mode. The rubber is hitting the road. Um, I won't go into detail on this, just in the interest of time, but Europe needs a lot of lithium and it needs it very quickly. It's the fastest growing lithium market in the world. It has zero supply. And the Europeans also want their battery raw materials to be low carbon or net zero carbon. Uh, and that's driven by the customer demands. And Europe needs a lot of renewable energy as well. Trying to get off Russian gas um, has been difficult. Uh, there is a supply shortage of renewable power and renewable heat in Europe. And there is a very strong focus on developing geothermal projects in Germany for that reason. Uh, so Europe is backing both critical raw materials production, um, lithium is at the top of the list, and renewable energy um, production and development in Europe. And this is causing a lot of regulatory tailwinds. And also um, now, finally, it's taken a while, funding mechanisms as well compete with the IRA as well. And this is largely coming through the member states. So France and Germany in particular um, will be funding their own projects and we intend to be a part of that. So a lot of uh, regulatory and hopefully government financing tailwinds um, behind our industry. Um, just to zoom into our project, so it looks a bit like this. There's a, um, uh, essentially there's an upstream and there's a downstream. Uh, there's a central collection point for the brine. Um, you can see two of these existing, two of these geothermal plants already exist. We're, we're operating these. We're building a large one um, in the center of our phase one area. And these will be fed by multiple well sites, including some of the ones that exist already. Um, we're basically going to expand the brine, existing brine production and um, therefore expands the geothermal energy production and then the lithium production as well. And then on the downstream side, uh, we will be located at a chemical park called Frankfurt Hook. So we're building a chemical plant within the chemical park. So that makes it a lot easier. This is what it looks like with a bird's eye view. So we're in southwest Germany, remember, so bordering northeast France. Um, we're in the Bunter Sandstone uh, Reservoir. Um, this has been producing geothermal brine for many years. Um, a lot of data stretching back many years, so the brine is very well understood. Um, we are producing from the core of the field here at our inside plant and the land plant nearby. We're expanding production from this area and we'll be transporting the lithium chloride upstream um, to the, um, sorry, downstream rather, to the uh, central lithium plant at Frankfurt Hoax. Um, the bigger picture, though, is that we are the largest license holder in the brine graben. So once we've executed phase one and we're focused on doing that really efficiently and really well, we aim to print and repeat. So phase one is about 24,000 tons per annum of lithium hydroxide production at 30 megawatts power, 30 megawatts heat. We aim to print and repeat um, beyond that phase two, phase three, etc. And we have room um, in our chemical plant to do so. It's basically adding more and more trains of production. Um, in the upstream and the downstream. Um, so there's quite a modular effect there. The important point is we're not resource constrained. The resource that we've defined so far is very, very large. It's one of the largest in the world. It's certainly the largest in Europe. Um, 26 million tons of contained lithium carbonate equivalent. So this is a really large brine resource in the center of Europe, very close to um, end user customers such as Stellantis and Volkswagen, um, Umicore as well. Um, so we are already expanding into France. Um, the French are moving very quickly in this space as well. We've, the resource doesn't stop at the border. So we've got some license applications, um, one of which is together with Stellantis, actually. Um, and we're also pushing um, mostly to the north of where we are on the German side as well. Wherever we build more lithium production, we can also build more renewable energy production as well. And there is no shortage of renewable heating supply, um, uh, renewable heating demand, I should say. Um, we have our own in-house drilling company, essentially onshore oil and gas rigs. They are electric, so we can keep our footprint net zero carbon. And we have our own in-house drilling crews as well. This is important because drilling um, gear, drill rigs are in short supply in Germany and everyone's rushing to develop geothermal projects in the area. So we have two out of about 12 rigs are available in the country. Um, we have a, um, a very long life sustainable resource that we've modeled phase one area over 30 years, and we see a very stable, steady decline of the lithium grades over time. And after 30 years, we're still well above our cost grade. So this is a long life multi-decade asset. 
And when we finish producing lithium someday and we're recycling all the lithium, what we leave behind is not a mine, it's a renewable energy asset. So um, there's a nice sort of circular story there. Um, our mine looks like this. It's a renewable energy plant. It's the size of a small supermarket. And basically, we're going to be building more of these. Um, you can see that we're surrounded by, by gardens, by vineyards, by fields. Um, so this is what we think lithium production in Europe uh, can look like, and indeed elsewhere in the world as well, where we can apply this technology. Um, we are building uh, a couple of things. So we're commissioning our lithium extraction optimization plant. This is like basically like a commercial demo, and this will serve as a, a product qualification and training facility over the next couple of years, once we build a full phase one lithium extraction plant. So commissioning of this plant will be completed in the next couple of months, and it will start producing the first tons of lithium chemicals ever domestically produced in Europe. Um, we're using a process which is very efficient. We won't go into details in the interest of time. Um, and for that reason, it is increasingly used in the lithium industry. And indeed, we see a wave of new lithium projects coming on stream, mainly from mining companies at the moment. Livent, Rio Tinto, Aramet um, are also building adsorption type DLE projects. Um, but interestingly, the, the next wave we see after this is coming from the oil and gas sector because they can deploy the skills and the personnel and the equipment they already have to um, increase lithium from brine production um, at a much larger scale. Um, it's sustainable, they can decarbonize their operations and they can redeploy um, their gear and personnel. So ExxonMobil, uh, Oxy, SLB, um, a lot of big players are entering the space, which makes it exciting. Um, once again, our only key differentiator from the existing producers using this technology, renewable heat, not heat from gas. Um, we've had three years of um, laboratory test work and piloting. We built our own pilot plants. We have our own Balkan labs in Germany. Um, we've developed our own sorbents because the sorbents that you can buy on the markets are all produced in China and Russia. So um, we produce ours in France. We call it Valsorb. It is in-house intellectual property, but it's based off a commercially proven technology. Um, it was actually meant in the 70s absorption type yearly, so very well understood. Um, for Arclay, as we said, we're building a chemical park chemical plants within the chemical park. We have uh, secured our site for this. And once again, there will be an optimization plant which will serve as a product qualification and training facility as well, whilst the commercial plant gets built. So we have our site secured and we're ready to go. And we've built our execution team. We've got about 320 personnel now in-house at Falcon. Um, so the team is big, they are very motivated and we've got some fantastic people from the oil and gas, geothermal um, and lithium industries. Um, and really ready to go into execution um, mode. So once again, the rubber is hitting the road. We will have a material decarbonizing effect on the industry. Um, the lithium industry is pretty carbon intensive at the moment, and we intend to produce um, essentially the lowest carbon lithium in the world for electric vehicles, but also with low water footprint and um, small land footprint as well. So it is engineered to have um, very high environmental performance, and this should affect our bottom line as well. So. Um, we should see uh, cheaper borrowing, um, lower cost of capital, because we are classified um, by many as a green project. Um, local community support, very important. The byproduct that we produce is renewable district heating. Um, so a lot of support um, uh, comes from that. And we have a very strong focus on, um, uh, on community works as a result. On the financing side, um, we should have a very low operating cost. Um, we have favorable uh, offtake agreements fixed, um, and this is important in a volatile lithium pricing environment. Um, but because we have that low operating cost, we're very well insulated from any ups and downs in the lithium market in the years to come. Um, but we see an enormous demand for our offtakers for more product if we can produce it. This gives us very healthy um, uh, financial metrics. Um, so just from phase one, 2.6 billion euro post tax NPV, 26% um, post tax IRR. Um, and that's including the whole integrated project, so renewable energy. Um, lithium extraction and lithium refining. Um, this gives us a capex of about 1.5 billion euro. Um, we have very low opex. I'd say our capex is sort of it, it's in it's in the middle. Um, remembering that we're also building a renewable energy part of the business as well. Um, we've engaged BNP Paribas on the financing. Um, we've had a very successful market signing exercise uh, for that financing, and um, we will officially kick off equity financing in November, aiming to raise the equity side at project level. And that's where the interest of the oil and gas guys um, uh, comes in because we've been receiving a lot of interest there. 
So we'll start to um, hopefully see some movement on there um, and firm up that interest. So just to finish off, um, I know we're time, um, but uh, um, just to cover from the uh, on the main points, um, we are the world's first and only zero carbon lithium company. We're moving into the execution phase now. We're well funded. We have um, some very supportive um, uh, and deep pocketed uh, um, substantial investors in the company. We have very strong off takers. Um, we have a fantastic team. We have the largest lithium resource in Europe. We have in-house um, lithium extraction IP optimization plants will be up and running um, in the next few weeks and months, producing the first tons of lithium product in Europe. Um, and we're moving into building um, Europe's largest and hopefully the world's most sustainable lithium project. So very excited about the weeks and months to come. Thanks, Francis. A great presentation and clearly Vulcan, uh, a company that many have watched over a long period of time and it, and it continues to kick goals for investors. Um, a, a large number of questions have come through, so we'll get straight to it. Situation in Europe, what is it like? You're on the ground and you are your, and your team are on the ground. What's it like? People, I think, expected it to move or react quicker than to what happened in the US, but they don't sort of understand the EU is a member state and it has to go through a process. But what is the situation like and what, what does government support potentially look like? So the EU is a very slow moving organisation. There's no, there's no getting around that. Um, they've got to deal with the member states pulling in lots of different directions. They can't move as quickly as the US, as a simple fact. So um, they have been knocked a bit by the IRA in you know, the battery sector, renewable sectors, um, because, the, because the US has moved much quicker. But um, they are now responding, and what they've done is quite smart. So they're freeing up the member states to fund their own projects. So usually they can't do that because of anti-competition law in the EU. In this special case, they've used existing pots of funds, which don't need to be re-approved, um, that were approved as part of, you know, the Ukraine crisis and COVID, and said, Germany, France, you know, whoever else, you go ahead, you use these existing pots of funds. It's called the tra uh, Temporary Crisis and transition framework or TCTF. Um, and there's significant funding available under this to fund critical raw materials projects um, like ours. Um, there's also similar schemes on the renewable energy side as well. So the best thing they could do is just free up the member states to go and fund their own projects. If you're in Eastern Europe, that's not so great because there's less funding to go around. If you're in Germany and France, as we are, um, fortunately, that's, that's quite a good position to be in because they're um, obviously um, well-financed states. And from a permitting point of view, from a financing point of view, are there other opportunities? Yeah, so there's uh, this strategic project status, which we'll be applying for, which um, uh, essentially should further speed up permitting. But um, honestly, well, our, our permitting is going pretty well at the moment. We've got really good engagement with the authorities. I, I'd say we're pretty much uniformly backed by um, all sides of the political spectrum in Europe. Everybody wants this it contributes to the auto industry, which is the biggest industry in Germany. Um, you know, it's national critical raw material security, and they are very alive to that now. Um, so, I mean, last time uh, I went over to Germany, we we saw federal ministers in Germany. You know, we we we, we had the honour to sort of sit down with um, some of the main decision makers in the space. Um, so they are taking what we're doing very seriously, and I I hope I, I can't promise, but I hope that that's going to translate into um, significant funding assistance as well. Um, which should help us with this financing process. But let, let's see, we won't rely on that, but um, we're certainly uh, hoping for some assistance. And with anything of this nature, there are risks. What are the key risks and how are you, how are you looking to deal with those? So we see it, our, our technical um, and you know, execution focused executives um, who come from the chemicals industry, the oil and gas industry, the lithium industry, um, they really see the main risk here as execution risks, not technical risks. So we're very comfortable with the, um, the technology, the, the technical side of things. Now it's all about making sure that we smoothly um, and efficiently execute. And that's um, where the, the expertise of these, particularly the oil and gas guys comes in because they're used to you know, an integrated project and the interface management fitting all the different parts of the project together. So it's that project execution mentality which we're getting into and we've got some great guys who joined us in the last few months including the ceo chris marino who replaced me as ceo i've moved to the chair role um, and that really reflects moving into execution mode so execution risk but i think we've got some really good people to um uh to to push that forward 
There's a good question here in regards to DLE and how that's changing the industry. How do you see it changing the industry and, and what are some other trends that investors should be looking out for? So I, I, I think I see it as Hard Rock was um, nearly 10 years ago. You know, Hard Rock was a really tough sell in 2014, 2015. I was pitching it to investors and it was seen as too high cost. Everyone said that the brines were, were just going to blow them out of the water. Um, and we all know what happened next. Um, uh, DLE, I mean, it's been around since 96, but um, now we're seeing um, now we're seeing rapidly increasing uh, adoption and building of these projects. Um, they have the ability to produce at much lower cost and with a much lower um, CO2 footprint as well. Um, so I think, I mean, we still need hard rock. It's, it's not a, a zero sum game. Um, but I think you're going to see a, a much bigger wave of supply come in backed by mining guys and the oil and gas guys. The key thing to watch out for, not all DLE is the same. So it's a catch-all term. That's why we say adsorption type DLE. Look out for companies that are doing adsorption type DLE because that's the um, that's the commercially proven method. And look out for companies, obviously I'm, I'm talking up my own book here, but um, it's... Uh, it, it, it's easy to sort of say you're going to buy from a technology supplier, but then as we've seen, typically these, these companies give away a slice of their, their project as a result. Um, look out for companies like Aramets, like Livents, like ourselves, who've built up their own in-house teams who know how to make and operate these organs. So I think that's really important as well. Final question, key catalysts. What should investors and those watching today be focused on over the coming months? So look out for us commissioning and um, bringing into operation the um, lithium extraction optimization plant, um, producing the first tons of material ever produced in Europe. It will be, hopefully, um, uh, uh, it will be a major proof point for investors. We've done this at pilot scale, and we're going to do it um, at a much larger scale. Um, so I think that will be a really good psychological point for financiers, for investors, for strategics watching us. That will happen over the um, the next couple of months. So it's an exciting point. And then um, look out for our financing process. I think um, uh, you'd be surprised at um, uh, the interest that we're getting around that and where that interest is coming from. Um, I think once the project is, once we see the the, the, um, uh, the blocks sort of falling into place on the financing, I think that will be um, really one of the final risks of the projects taken away as well. Um, and, um, you know, look out for updates on execution um, remaining permits coming in and the bills starting to happen on the time um, all the time. All of those, I think, are very important um, catalysts and proof points to de-risk the project. So a, a lot's going to happen over the next uh, few weeks and months and watch this space. As you say, it's been very busy over the last few years and it's going to be busy still, which investors like to see. They like to see news flow and they like to see activity. So Vulcan, a company to watch. We look forward to watching with interest. Francis, thanks for your time. Thanks so much, David. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Cheers. As I said in my introduction, the purpose of this webinar series is to give you the opportunity to engage directly with companies that are on your watch list and to give you ideas of companies you might want to potentially add to your watch list so you can follow them in the future and maybe invest. So look at your watch list. Let us know if there are any companies on there that you want to hear from or let us know about companies you've been thinking about adding to your watch list and we'll get them on to present in the near future. Thank you to the presenters for making your time available, making your time available, and also to you for watching. We'll see you again in a few weeks' time. Have a great day.